time. So if you are a speaker, you should remember to uh, protect the next speaker from being bombarded with too many questions. <laughs> OK, and we, ha we also have got the corrupt block, uh, which is now deleted from the blockchain. And we are restarting from Genesis again. So I'd like to introduce uh, Chen Chen, uh, who is a graduate student at MIT. She's going to talk about consensus too. Thank you for the introduction, Elaine, and thank you to Dahlia Elaine for the invitation to present here. Um, uh, this is currently still ongoing work with Ted Shria and Neha Larula at the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. So this project got started while I was doing a summer internship at the MIT DCI. And we're hoping to put this up on archive and ePrint sometime late November to early December. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about adaptive adversaries and block consensus and using VDS to combat leader corruption. So this was actually very good scheduling on the part of the organizers because the model that I'm going to be talking about will be the exact same model that Raphael talked about in the previous talk. So um, a lot of the slides will be overlapping, which means that I'll be skipping through some of the slides uh, if they were talked about a lot in the previous presentation. So again, the goal of large scale consensus is there are millions of participants. We can't have all of these participants send messages because that will flood the network. So a reasonable goal, a reasonable goal for us to have is we want sublinear number of messages or multi, uh, messages or multicasts. So subquadratic total number of messages sent and sublinear multicasts, where multicast is defined as a replica sending a message to all nodes in the network. What this translates to is we also want polylogarithmic number of rounds. And multi, a sublinear multicast complexity immediately implies that not everyone in the network will get to speak during an iteration of the protocol. We also want our protocol to be robust against strong adversaries. So this talk will center on the definition of a strong adversary. So I'll actually describe what I mean by strong adversary later. And we also want to avoid uh, energy wasting proof of work. So proof of work these days, uh, when you go down to the very, very core is you want to compute some hash. Um, and because the computation of hash uh, values is easily parallelizable, what proof of work has dissolved into is a race to build better ASICs that can compute these hashes in parallel. And this has led to a very energy intensive uh, type of computation. So we want to avoid this in our protocols. So the idea, the key idea of how to avoid this comes from uh, this very nice work by Chen and McKelly called Algorand, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. Um, and the idea is you want to elect a small, usually polylogarithmic size community uh, or a committee. Uh, this is called cryptographic sortition. And then run a more or less traditional consensus protocol on this committee, which votes. Of course, it's not exactly traditional. There are, exists other tweaks you need to do in the protocol. I think this idea actually was like uh, from a long time ago. There's a lot of papers like that. Oh, yes. Papers by King and Saya. Like, they, they all kind of build upon it. They oh, I see. The cryptographic sortition. Oh, I see. I think the cryptographic sortition. Uh, <laughs> the term might have been introduced by this paper, but yes, I agree. There's a, a lot of previous papers which this paper builds upon. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. So um, now I'm going to talk about adversaries and consensus, which uh, basically this Algorand um, uh, protocol was built to try to combat. And um, so let me just start with what traditional adversaries are like in consensus. So traditional adversaries for consensus introduced in the 1980s and 1990s basically have static adversaries, meaning you have a set of replicas. Before the iteration of the protocol is run, the adversary chooses a set of replicas to corrupt and become Byzantine. And basically, Byzantine nodes don't have to follow the protocol, which means that they can choose to send arbitrarily number of messages, do whatever they want. So after you select these Byzantine adversaries and 
is usually one third for partially synchronous and one half for synchronous. Uh, you run the consensus protocol. The consensus protocol then agrees on some number of values in your log. But for adaptive adversaries, which was also mentioned in Raphael's talk, we want to look at adversaries which can choose uh, these set of Byzantine nodes adaptively, depending on what your protocol does. So the rationale for this is consensus nowadays are used for managing billions of dollars. So there's an incentive for adversaries to be smarter and be better in terms of uh, corrupting this consensus protocol. So in the adaptive adversary model, initially before the protocol is run, you can corrupt a few nodes or you can choose to corrupt no nodes at all. So everybody can start off honest if the adversary wants everybody to start off honest. Then you run the protocol. At some particular step in the protocol, the adversary could decide, oh, there is a key player in the protocol. Let me corrupt that player right now. So immediately after some step, or immediately before some step of the protocol, the adversary can say, I'm going to corrupt this key player in the protocol. And they corrupt this player. So they can do this repeatedly. They don't have to corrupt uh, their fraction of uh, Byzantine nodes immediately. They can choose to wait uh, some number of steps before they corrupt another replica. So uh, even though they can corrupt adaptively, there's still some uh, bound on the total number of replicas they can corrupt. And also, once a replica is corrupted, it stays corrupted for the duration of this iteration of the protocol. <coughs> so it seems like we're giving the adversary a very uh, strong uh, role in, this, uh, in corrupting this protocol. But in fact, this can model a number of real life situations. For example, you can bribe a certain player, uh, a certain crucial player in the protocol. You can also selectively pull together all your resources and DDoS a very important player at this particular time. And you can also pull together all your resources and hack this person. So this, these are a number of situations which could allow somebody to be adaptive and corrupt a key player at some point. OK, so here are some uh, ways the adaptive adversary can leverage their adaptiveness to mess with the protocol. So if you have a, first of all, if you have a predictable leader schedule, you can corrupt the leader before they are elected. If everybody in the protocol can say who's going to be the next leader, you can just corrupt the leader before they become elected. And then once they become elected, because you have a predictable leader schedule, they will just prevent uh, liveness, meaning preventing the protocol from um, making progress. Even if you have a random leader schedule, you can corrupt the leader right after they're uh, elected, which means that afterwards, you can flood the network with many uh, junk proposals or a conflicting proposal. Uh, again, violating liveness here. If you have a committee, uh, if you have a small poly logarithmic committee, the adversary also has enough budget to corrupt the entire committee. So after you corrupt the committee, you can send votes for every proposal. Because you're a Byzantine node, you can vote for whatever you want. You can potentially send votes for every proposal, violating safety, uh, safety, or selectively send votes to certain honest members and not others, and making people think that they have different logs of committed uh, transactions. So these are some of the ways adaptive adversaries can uh, mess with the protocol. So algorithm solves um, all of these problems using the following methods. Um, they introduce this cryptographic sortition, which has been mentioned in various uh, other presentations before me. Um, basically, you cannot predict the set of leaders or uh, committee members that are chosen ahead of time. They also introduce player replaceability, which means that each leader or committee only gets to speak once, and only gets to do one role in the protocol before they're replaced again. So yes. what I meant was the was, this, um, was uh, described, I think, uh, a lot earlier. Oh, yes. The yes. The VRF was actually first described by Definitis, the white paper. I see. And then, uh, I 
to argue why the paper came out before they finished this. Oh, on no, archive. not their wife, but their talk. Like you, you can go, go on YouTube and look at that. Yeah, probably you can find Sylvia's talk earlier yes. than that. Okay, well, then. then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, but thanks. Thank you for pointing out that. Yes. Um, uh, so this is described in many of our grants' works. However, they also need to assume this key erasure model to deal with the second type, the second two types of attacks I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, so again, what is this key erasure model? The model states that keys can be erased at will, arbitrarily from a replica storage without recovery possibilities. So as Raphael mentioned in his previous talks, there's many um, possible reasons why this might not be feasible in the real world. Uh, this could include hardware failures, so the hardware just fails to erase the key, or the hardware could have fault-tolerant backups, meaning that you think that the hardware erased the key from some part of the hardware, but it could, it could have actually saved the key somewhere else to deal with fault tolerancy. Uh, or there could be human errors. The program could have just had an error or, or had a flaw in its code and failed to erase the key. So there are possibilities. And also, as Raphael mentioned, there's potential bribing involved um, with respect to having people save their keys and somebody, selling, uh, somebody buying these keys and potentially launching a long range attack. So, it's at least interesting to explore alternatives to key erasure because of these re possible reasons why they, it, it is hard to implement it in the real world. So the rest of this talk will be focusing on exploring alternatives to key erasure to solve the problem of corrupting leaders and committees, members after election. Yes? Key erasure uh, allows you to not forge, but uh, my key or my secret, it's me, and if I erase it, I erase myself. <laughs> I mean, the idea is you want to erase the keys just so if somebody corrupts you, they can't keep voting as you. So basically, if you erase a key after you perform your action, you're not allowed to perform more actions for that step. And that's a whole protection against somebody corrupting you after you became leader or somebody corrupting you after you became a committee member from doing a bunch of uh, things like, sending out junk proposals or sending out junk votes and such. Yeah, so it, it, is, it is a way to erase yourself just so you can protect yourself against the adversary who might control you. Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the works that seeks to uh, deal with this uh, not using the key erasure assumption or the key erasure model is uh, a work on binary Byzantine agreement. So I'm gonna quickly define what binary Byzantine agreement is. So binary Byzantine agreement is all nodes are given a bit as input. You must agree on the bit zero or one. If all honest nodes start with one bit uh, as input, say they all start with one, then you must agree on one. So recently, um, a work by some number of people in this room and others uh, used vote specific eligibility instead of the erasure model to determine the votes for a binary Byzantine agreement. So here, you mine a vote by passing into the argument one or zero uh, and the round number. Uh, and then the honest replicas, this is very important, the honest replicas only try to mine one of the votes, so one or zero. So the way that this provides security is that even if uh, a voter, so somebody who attempted to mine a vote, gets corrupted and tries to mine for the other bit. It will be hard for them and with high probability cannot mine enough votes for the other bit. Uh, so this was also mentioned in the previous talk, so, I, so for, in the interest of time, I refer you to the previous talk for the analysis. So a natural extension of this is to also pass in the block, not just the bit. So if you want to extend that technique to general block consensus, we say instead of passing in the bit one or zero, we pass in the entire block. So as mentioned uh, and emphasized in previous presentation, this results in a grinding issue. And I just want to emphasize this again because this is also important for my presentation. So with this protocol, the adversarial strategy 
would be to create an arbitrarily large number of transactions to attempt to create a block that obtains disproportionate number of adversarial votes. So what this essentially means is that you grind through many blocks in an attempt to make sure that your, your Byzantine nodes get a disproportionate number of votes for that block. So by the churn out bound, if you assume um, the committee size is lambda, uh, the probability that this happens on any particular block is approximately e to the negative omega epsilon squared lambda. So let's just suppose the adversary, we have an ideal adversary, um, and somehow uh, the person choosing the committee set the committee size log n, and epsilon is constant. Then the adversary, the very ideal adversary, needs to only grind through all of n uh, messages to obtain one in expectation so that uh, a majority of adversaries control the votes for that block. So again, this is the ideal adversary, but if we assume in our model that an adversary can grind through arbitrarily large number of finite messages, they can do this uh, regardless of what the probability of uh, failure is. So what this essentially means is that we have dissolved this problem into a proof of work, which means that you can do this grinding of messages in parallel and a person or an adversary who has more computation power is able to grind for greater number of adversarial votes. So as Raphael mentioned, consensus through herding solves this problem by assigning scores to transactions by age and then batching together the transactions. So, and also the main part is they hash the batch to a smaller sample space. So you can't grind through as many uh, big messages. So you, you still have some grinding, but it's not enough of an effect to um, get the result that you want. But a strategy for their protocol, an adversarial strategy for their protocol, is to flood the network with a bunch of adversarial transactions. What does this mean? If you flood the network with a bunch of adversarial transactions, then you will have a bunch of adversarial transactions which become old transactions and therefore will have a greater weight of the score put on the, those transactions. So what this essentially impacts is block size as well as block quality. So if we care about block quality, meaning a large number of transactions should be honest transactions instead of adversarial transactions, if you use this batch strategy, you'll basically get every single adversarial transaction in a block. And if you want to somehow avoid this, you need to do, uh, do something in addition. So to reiterate, of the, uh, to reiterate the problems that we want to solve with our protocol, we want to propose something that doesn't use the key erasure model. And we also want to ensure some quality measure of the block uh, as opposed to just having all adversarial transactions uh, be committed. So the intuition we, we use to solve this problem is that each block proposal takes some number of time steps. Even if somebody has a parallel computer, you still have to take this number of time steps to, to compute some proof of the proposal. And it would be impossible to propose two different messages before the next round occurs because you have to take this many time steps to compute some proof of the proposal. So the intuition is, as Ron mentioned in the previous, uh, during the previous presentation, is that we want to somehow commit to our block before we send it. And this is a form of com a commitment that is very distinct from proof of work. It's just a commitment that you have to spend some number of steps before you're able to propose a block. So what do I exactly mean? And now I will uh, explain what I, exact, what, what I mean exactly. So we're dealing here with uh, the synchronous model. So the synchronous model has been uh, summarized again and again in the previous presentation, so I won't summarize it again. But just as a note, our protocol will be operating in the synchronous model. So now we use this primitive, this recently constructed primitive called a verifiable delay function. 
And the verifiability function is a function that takes some input as well as a difficulty parameter. So the difficulty parameter, as I denoted here d, is the time it takes to compute the function, even on a parallel computer. So parallelization shouldn't help you here. Uh, but once you computed the output and the proof, uh, the output can be easily verified, and verified in a short amount of time. So formally, you have this function that takes a, a security parameter gamma, a difficulty parameter d, uh, the time is, that is necessary for it uh, to run before it gets the output, an input x and an output y, and a proof. Um, and with some, you have to do some secure setup uh, to get, obtain this function. So again, y is the output, pi is the proof. There exists a verify function that taken, taking in the input, the output, as well as the proof, determines whether the input, uh, the output that is inputted into this verify function is the correct output given the, the input x. And this verify function can be run in logarithmic time of uh, the d value, the difficulty value. So you can verify quickly. Again, verification is quick. So I want to emphasize some properties of VDFs that we use in our protocol. The first property is the honest party takes approximately the same amount of time to compute the VDF. So no more than 1 plus epsilon d time for some small epsilon depending on setup. Uh, this property called adversary sequentiality is basically saying a parallel adversarial algorithm cannot compute the solution in less than d time. And uniqueness, an adversarial algorithm cannot compute a solution that is not equal to the intended output. And when I say cannot here, everything, when I say cannot, I mean with negligible probability. So everything, everything in this setting is with high probability setting. So both of these cannot, you can interpret it as with negligible probability they can do the following. And it takes O of log D verification time, where D is a difficulty parameter. So now I will describe our protocol. So our protocol, first of all, assumes a round VDF, where each replica per computes the output from the VDF continuously. Uh, if it is the first honest replica to compute the output, then it multicasts it to all other replicas. So this VDF takes time d. So what I mean by compute this VDF continuously is that it takes the output of the previous VDF computation and passes in to the next VDF computation. And all the honest replicas have the same copy of the VDF. So that even if a, an honest replica chooses not to compute uh, this VDF output for a round, they will be able to obtain it and check it from an other replica who, who has computed this output for this round and has multicasted it, as well as its proof. Um, and we use this to delineate rounds. So the rounds are these red lines, which are unfortunately a bit hard to see. Um, and we say that round L starts from when row L, which is the output of the VDF, is computed and sent to everybody, to when the next output of the round VDF is computed. So using this, we can perform leader election. So in leader reaction, we first randomly decide if a leader using this output from the round VDF. Um, so we randomly de determine the leader using the VRF uh, construction, um, which is similar to the leader election from Algorand. It's, it's just a simple um, computation. Uh, and then once the replica has decided that it's the leader, it computes a separate message VDF output. So each replica, honest replica, uh, as well as adversarial uh, replica, has its own individual uh, VDF function. And it takes into this VDF function the output of the random selection of whether it's leader, as well as the block that it wants to send out. 
So once it determined whether it's a leader, it puts into another VDF the output of this uh, VRF, say, output, as well as a block. So this VDF has difficult d minus 2 epsilon minus 2 log d. So once it has finished computing the result of this message VDF, it will then multicast the result of this message VDF, the proof of uh, the result of this message VDF, the proof that it was indeed leader, as well as a block. So now we, we use vote-based eligibility to determine voting on this block that this proposer has proposed. So upon receiving some proposal, so again, this is the same format as the proposal that was sent here, you determine whether you can vote on the proposal via vote-based committee selection on the block that was proposed. And if, it is, if you successfully mined a vote, you multi multicast to everybody the vote on this block and the proof that you can vote on it. So if we use a VRF in this first step, then the proof of the work, or a proof of the vote would just be the proof of the VRF output. So this is basically the same vote-based eligibility as was used in Herding and also in binary Byzantine agreement. And finally, we must be able to commit a block. So to commit a block, after receiving a two-thirds majority of votes, assuming polylog size committees uh, for three consecutive rounds, so the key here is the rounds must be consecutive. So three consecutive rounds, you confirm the block. And this proof um, was inspired by Hostov com commitment scheme, but it's also very similar to a lot of the standard commitment schemes used in th these types of protocols. So I want uh, to conclude this talk with some emphasis on the safety measures of our protocol. So we, pre we protect against leader corruption after election because you can, any, say, leader who determined that they were a leader and mined the first proposed block does not have enough time to compute the other block before the next round starts. You cannot mine an other vote for a different block, even if you corrupt the committee, because no, no more than one block exists in expectation. And with overwhelming probability in polylogarithmic round, you have at least one set of C over three, uh, equals three rounds, which will have three consecutively honest proposers and committees. So you'll be able to commit a block. And in polylog rounds to a termination of protocol, and assuming committees of polylogarithmic size, you get a message complexity of log, uh, n times polylog n uh, rounds. This, this should be polylog. This is a typo here. So it should be message complexity O of n times polylog n um, message complexity, or O of polylog multicast complexity. So before I conclude, uh, I want to put in a plug for the Crypto Economics Systems Journal. Um, so Neha is the director of this journal and is currently receiving some number of submissions and is due next week. And Dahlia is also on the board of this journal. So quick plug. And let me go back to uh, this, uh, uh, our final VDF-based block consensus. And I'm happy to take questions now. Yeah. So uh, since the VDF is the main component of the like, system, I would like to like, ask a question around this and the instantiation of the like, section 35. So if you use the um, constructions by Vesolovsky and Petra, yeah. You must instantiate the VDF. Yes. Uh, some way. So you, either need, you need a group of unknown order. So yes. how would you pick the group of unknown order? Would you do an MPC? Would you use a class group? And also, uh, the follow-up question on this is that the prover has to be reasonably efficient, yes. like the, the calculator of the squarings, such that um, like you get the, the actual delay. But like, what if? You, how how would you like? Uh, protect against an adversary that is able to calculate the VTF faster than the rest of the network. When you have the application-specific hardware, like the Ethereum, Filecoin, etc. way. 
So for our protocol, let me just answer that second question first. So for our protocol, we can actually handle up to some constant factor uh, of difference in between how fast the adversary can compute the VDF versus how fast the honest party can compute the VDF. Yes. Um, so we have we can handle up to some some constant. Um, it's just the protocol I showed here. It's a very very simplified overview protocol. Um, but in our more complex proofs, we can handle up to some constant. Um, with respect to initial secure setup, um, we just assume the existence of some secure setup um, from the VDF because we use a sort of like a black box construction. So yeah. do you have a separate? You have like VDF sub I there. Is that separate public parameters, separate setup for every participant? It doesn't have to be. Um, I presented it as a separate setup just uh, for clarity that we want each individual person to compute their own message uh, themselves. Because you have no incentive to compute messages for others, but it doesn't have to be. Yes. yes. Why do you compute two thirds more to the synchronous Sorry? I'm sorry. So can you do this for half, for example? Uh, so our proofs are in terms of two halves. Uh, the question was um, whether we can do safety for half, safety and liveliness for half instead of two-thirds. So our proofs are in terms of two-thirds, uh, mainly our uh, commitment proofs, because we, we use similar proof techniques as to previous papers. Perhaps, but it requires more thought. Yeah, Dalia. Uh, first of all, very nice talk and a uh, nice uh, core idea. Uh, I really like it. Uh, I wanted to ask, so uh, one of the difficulties with VRF, with using VRF in these protocols, is that it's uh, uh, difficult or impossible to get exactly one leader. You can either get yes. too many leaders or risk not having leaders. Yes. Um, uh -huh. In your case, there would be no liveness if round after round after round there are two leaders. Oh, so that's a branching. That's the, that will result in some branching. So we'll, this is exactly why we need three consecutive rounds. So that we, we assume that if we allow for three consecutive rounds after polylogarithmic, say, times uh, a particular round of this protocol is run, you'll get three consecutive rounds in which uh, a unique leader was elected and also the committee was honest. Um, so if you get two, if you get two leaders proposing two different blocks, your votes will be split, and you just won't make progress on that round. But then you'll get another leader, um, and in polyalgorithmic rounds with high probability, you'll probably get three, three consecutive rounds in which you can commit afterwards. Okay. So yeah. Yes, I have a similar question about okay. difficulty levels of the VDF. Yes. Uh, you say that so leaders election is VDF and. Yes. Committee selection is VDF or VRF? VRF. 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 Committee reactions are VRF. We don't use a VDF at all for the committee election. Okay, it's not yeah. The leader. Only leader. Oh yeah. Is leader election is only based on VRF. So there we don't use a VDF. We only use the round VDF output for committee uh, for leader election. After you get elected, you use a VDF to basically commit to your message. Okay. Right. 